different format to our usual. Um, there'll be no IOSH update or um, discussion with committee or whatever at the end of this. This is purely um, going to be focused on risk assessment uh, and in relation to machinery safety and pure provision use of work equipment regs. Um, this is the first in a short series, a summer school as we're calling them, of back to basic sessions. You will have read about them in, uh, in your invitation through Connect or however you found us. And um, uh, we'll be following this up um, every Wednesday until the 1st of September. Um, so our next session next week on uh, manual handling, we'll be covering other aspects, work at height, um, asbestos, chemicals, slips and trips, uh, and ending up with PPE, thinking of the hierarchy of safety. Um, so I don't really want to waste too much time other than to say uh, your speaker today, presenter today, David Stansill, he'll introduce himself. He gave an excellent presentation to IOSH Manchester and Northwest District's uh, branches. And um, I, I felt it was it encapsulated everything we needed to know. It was a much longer session. So David has got the challenge of, of restricting himself to the three quarters of an hour to give you, uh, to give you time at the end of that session. It's end at um, quarter two. Um, I'm happy to stay online longer, um, but uh, we will be recording it. So it could be watched again later. Ideal for anyone doing uh, needing to do CPD, new to the sector, moving to other uh, workplaces, work environments, thinking about a toolbox talk, whatever, uh, and David's uh, original presentation and uh, resources are already available within the IOSH community on the Manchester branch um, uh, website. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over now to David and um, if you could share your screen and take it away. Um, I'll pick up on any questions and Melissa, our chair there is, is behind the scenes too. Uh, we'll pick up on the Q&A. If you could put those in the chat box, please. And um, then we'll pick up those questions um, later on in the session to make sure David can rattle through all his slides. So David, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'll just start uh, sharing the slide. <clears throat> There we go, David. That's it. Thank you. You see that now, Alan? That's fine now. I'd like to give you, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to take you through all my experiences as a she manager on really the evolution and really my experiences with the pure assessment. Uh, I first started work in 82 in mining, moved on to industry then for McCain Foods. Uh, Nestle, and then obviously where I work now, which is Green Core. So obviously I'd just like to share my experiences as I went through industries, looking at the pure assessment and how I dealt with it and really what I came across when doing pure assessments. Really to be motivated, this is my main reason. You know, it's about people and families, like every safety manager, is that when you're there, you don't want anybody going on to the family is injured. And so it was important to me to look at pure assessments because when they work with machinery at work, I don't want that machinery to hurt anybody as they're going home. So that was my main motivation. So looking at pure assessments, and I've been on quite a few machinery courses in time, but every machinery course I went on about pure assessments varied depending which, which person was actually teaching you or learning you about pure and machinery. And I did really make me feel uncomfortable what I was doing and the basics, really looking at identified hazards with that, what I needed to do, and how really, as a safety manager, could I ensure that machinery was safe when people was working with it, operating it, maintaining it, and cleaning it. So I really wanted to look at the main hazards of social machinery, look at the standards and the British standards, and especially the, the pure regulations, and what does it really mean to me to really to do a sufficient pure assessment so I can say if anybody came to see me at my site, have I got the pure assessments for that machinery? I'm really am I comfortable with that, that I've done a sufficient suitable risk assessment for that type of machinery and what we're actually operating. So pure assessments, really, have they ever been developed internally? I've had a lot of different ones, a lot of check sheets, and I'll go through all that. But really what I wanted is one document where I could actually rationale and look at it 
and see really what I've done is I can develop and set to somebody if, if the HSE came on site that this is where I got my information from, this is what I was following. So really it was one document what actually did everything. And so pure assessments to me seemed isolated with them tick boxes when I first started and what documentation we had. So this is what I really developed to make sure that we're right when it comes to a risk assessment. So I'd really like to take you through really my basics on what I did for the evolution of that pure assessment. So as I said, different types of risk assessments over different years. I first started off with a check sheet as it got us in, in running NIP hazard, et cetera. Then a bit more defined when it comes to different more information to really where I've got to now is what I find is a risk assessment, which I can look at it, go to machine and know I'm comfortable. I've identified the risk and what requires to be done with that piece of machinery. I've also had a, on in my history, I've had a, uh, quite a few external people come on site to do pure assessments. But what I found when I did get external people in, I got a full 10,000 page report what told me what the hazards was, but rep never really told me how to control it, how to manage it. And now I've got other departments involved with them risk assessments and that report to move on. And so people owned it at site. So there were never no really interaction with the engineers apart from, there you are, you've got 10,000 actions to do now, please get on with those to make that machinery safe. So I've had a lot of bad experience with third parties Really, I think that may be by not setting off really what the scope was for that work to be undertaken uh, when they came on site. So this is the content now, uh, our pure assessments. We have a front cover with an indicator on in segments, what tells us the tracker where we are with risk assessment. We have 11 pages of identifying hazards with that actual machinery. I'm not saying they've got every hazard there, but you have checked for it you've, so you can prove that you've done a check to see that the hazard's not available. We've also got there then a general risk assessment. We do a training specification and then we do an action list for that actual pure assessment. So what I would like to do is break these down into more detail to let you know what, what this is all about. But when I go and do a risk assessment, I need to take certain things with me. So I have a pointer which is six millimeters on that finger. So I'm looking for nip points. I have a tape measure to measure my guarding, besides the guarding mis distances to hazards. I have a camera, which is important to take photos of what I'm identifying. I have a laminated assessment sheet, so I can actually work on that one, take it back to my office, and then actually fill in the one which is electronic. And the other thing I need is a good pair of knees, because what I'm saying there is you can't look at machine without looking underneath it for hazards as well. So you do quite a bit of kneeling depending on the height of the actual machine when you're walking around that equipment and assessing hazards. As I said, on the front cover, this is an indicator what tells me where we are with that specific machine based on what I require by that risk assessment. So the first segment you see coloured in is are we undertaking a pure assessment? When that has been completed, we'll cover in, uh, colour that in green so we know that that's been completed. And then we'll move around the segments and it's obviously it's evolution has been it's, it's a rectangular and a yes and no box, which does it hyperlinked. So it does it automatic. But the things what I put in a pure assessment is we're doing a pure assessment. We're doing a general risk assessment. Is the equipment on the asset register so it can be PM'd and be inspected on a regular basis? Operating procedures have been completed, a training spec specification, a cleaning card. And once all those segments are green, then we finalise and colour in the last segment green to say it's all been completed. So that's really telling us where we are with progress when we look at this risk assessment front cover page. On that front cover, we have reference numbers. So obviously, for example, this machine was a Jacob White. Who is the supplier, which is, should be the same as Jacob White? Has it got an asset serial number? The location at the site where it's at? the line it's at, and then we do a risk assessment number. Uh, number. So that's Kiviton, pure risk assessment in the bakery, and the numbers are related to the asset number, which is, is being given on the asset register. So that's how we really reference all those risk assessments. So we know if anybody comes on site, they can go look at the asset on the asset register. I know then we've got pure assessment, and it's the same number really what we've got from the asset register. On the front cover as well, I always put a picture of the machine, what we're assessing. Because what I've learned in the past is, is you'll actually do a pure assessment for a machine, 
and then you'll find out it's required somewhere else in the factory and it's a different location. So your assessment then is out of date because really what you're saying is I've assessed it this location, attached to this type of machinery, but then it's moved and there's been different hazards exposed to that machine and also for employees. So I always like to take a photo so I know what position it was in when actually undertaken the actual pure assessment. So the general risk assessment and the indicator really comes from what I actually looked in the past where somebody come up with a great idea about putting an actual card on the side of a machine as a segment to say, has it been inspected on a certain day? And that's really the evolution why I use that segment uh, on the pure assessments is just an indicator to say where I am with that risk mm -hmm. assessment. I don't put this on the machine. I leave it on the pure assessment documentation because obviously I think it's just relevant for the safety people, the engineering and the operational people on the factory to know where we are with certain risk assessments. So this is what the actual risk assessment looks like. This is one of the pages. It's referenced down the side one to two, pictorial, a bit of guidance, what regulations, and obviously is a hazard associated, yes or no, with a risk rating and any first any further things identified. So we'll go into this a bit more deeper. So as I said, the hazard references is one all the way down. And you'll that is really when you bring in for the action plan what references which it relates to for that pure assessment. Then we have the machinery hazards, and this obviously is just pictorial diagrams to show you what we're looking at. So the first one is suitability of the actual machinery. Is it suitable for the environment where you're going to actually operate that equipment? Is it a wet process? Is it dry? Is it ATEX, etc.? Is it being designed to be used in that type of environment? So when you look at the pictorial actual uh, guidance you've got there, on different hazards, we have different pictures. And in total, on the pure assessment, we've got 105 checks to complete for that pure assessment. So it talks about size of hazards for nip points underneath machinery if it's guarded. Is it rotating? Can you lock it out? Is it fully guarded? Is there a danger from fire, etc.? All these are the certain things what we look at through that pure assessment, which is pictorial. And the guidance is the equipment. So we're asking people who's doing the pure assessments to give them little prompt and guidance what they're looking for with that pictorial picture, what you see on the actual pure assessment. So again, you're asking that question to yourself, is it suitable to design construction for that purpose in that area? On the next section, we've got the standard legal requirements why we're asking that question. So where does it fit under with the actual uh, British standards, with pure regulations and why you're asking it and where it comes from? And I'm no different to any other safety manager. Do I know all the British standards off the art of that standard? I can go look at that actual British standard I've got with, with my documentation. OK, I'm looking, there's a colour coded for a reset button blue. It tells me what the standard is. Yeah, OK, I'm, I'm happy with that. I know where to go. So in the pure assessments, there's guidance on what standard you're looking at on the pure assessment. If there is a hazard there, then what I will do then is colour in yes or no. It, it's there, the actual hazard, and I'll put a photo. So these are just examples of photos I take around machinery, which these are hazards I've identified that piece of equipment. And I'm not saying here that you have to close out every hazard what you see. If you've got a moving conveyor belt, there's always chance of friction if you've got your hand on side of it. So they're the sort of things that I identify, but would I close them out fully? I don't think I would. But there I'd put in the photo to show it's being identified. This tells me yes or no. On the pure assessment, it does it automatic for you. But then you identify, if you've got an hazard, what have you identified as the issue? So I've got here gauge dial broken, the asset zero pressure. It's not working. So why can you tell if you've isolated it, you've got zero pressure? So on this, we follow that on, mm -hmm. assess the risk, and then we'd put on an action to get that actual uh, pressure gauge actually uh, uh, repaired. We will then put existing controls we've got in place. So we've got pure assessment, factory PDIs, PMs. So what we've got in place on the pure assessment to control that risk. And then we'll do a risk evaluation for this. So we're looking at an evaluation of risk. Like every pure assessment, you're looking at high, medium and low to see where your biggest risks are 
to see what you actually need to like, start working on straight away. So we do A, B, and then we obviously add them together to make a risk rating. So this is our evaluation of the risk assessment. So really evaluation at risk, what's the frequency to exposure? So what we're saying here on different on the risk assessment, how, how it actually exposes a person? Is it once a week, once a day, daily exposure two to four times a day or every hour? And depending on the more exposure and contact the machine, we give it risk rating from one to four. And then we'll look at ease of access to that dangerous parts of the equipment. So is it very easy? Is it a waste site? He's got his hand there. He can put his hand in straight away. It's very easy. Then we've got three. Is it easy? Is he moving his boxes about on a conveyor? He can touch it at the side. Is it difficult or is it very difficult to touch that hazard? That's important to me because when we look in there is, is you know, how, what's the actual probability to get hurt if it's very difficult to get to that actual dangerous part? Can that be ranked a bit lower for me when I come to start having actions to actually improve that machinery as we move forward? So once I've identified the, the frequency to exposure, the ease of exposure to that dangerous part, I can look at severity of injury. And what I look at there is, will it be a minor first aid if it touches that hazard? Will it be medical treatment, a rid or over seven days, or a fatal or irreversible, a loss of limb? I'll rate it. And what I do then is, I add that then to the A and Bs to likely of injury to give a risk rating. So that's just to form what we use for risk rating based on machinery. Once I've completed the risk rating, I will then put further actions. And then obviously, like you can see as an example of that pressure gauge, I put there that we change the pressure gauge to make sure we know it's on zero when that gauge is operating. So there's an action to be completed. So those actions then will then go on to the pure assessment and obviously into the engineering action tracker for them to actually in, in, improve that machinery. We then do a general risk assessment and we like to do these task based. So this is just a general format we use. So not only do we do the pure assessment, we do a general risk assessment on that piece of equipment. And we like to do it by task base. So it's like checking the equipment, connecting it to the power supply, using the correct PPE, filling the brat pan. Obviously, this is a small cooking vessel with, with ingredients. And we do the hazards. And again, we do a little risk rating for this to look at a general risk assessment. So we know then we've got a, a general risk assessment for that piece of equipment. Again, once that's complete, we will then color the actual segment in green. So equipment placed on the maintenance register is important, like I said, for asset maintenance. And when you get your technical file of equipment, it tells you your frequency inspection for that equipment. So you can see here that you know, you're maintaining and managing that equipment as we should on any site. Then we'll do a safe operating procedure. So obviously these vary at different fractures where you go to. Well, this is one of the standards. What we use is a standard operating procedure. We'll identify the equipment on the first page. We'll identify the PP, and if it's green or shaded, you can see what equipment you require. And then we'll identify the basic hazards with that machine. So mainly the top five or six, these are the hazards, these are the consequences. And then really the training specification, the actual operating procedure tells you how to operate that equipment safe and safely manner. So these may go really to maybe three or four uh, operating procedure pages, maybe longer depending on what type of equipment you're operating. So just to give you an example of the operating procedures, what we use at the Green Corps site. Once they've been completed, the operating procedures will then move on to the training specification. So for every piece of machinery, what we use on site, we have a signed off sheet by a trainer to train the operators and how to manage and operate that equipment. So first of all, as a trainee understood the SOP and the risk assessment related to that equipment, have they got knowledge and understanding of the risk assessment SOP, and then we'll observe the skills of operating it in a sufficient manner. And then once they've been trained on it, we'll assess them on the habit, the following procedures quite correctly. That's signed by the trainer and the trainee. We issue a certificate and that goes into the actual trainee's uh, training file to prove that he's been trained on that piece of equipment. So this is a standard format we use for all this machinery on site. And they both sign it off to say they're happy, they can operate it without any more close personal supervision. So once that training specification has been complete, we move on to the cleaning procedure. 
So there you go, so I ain't go there. So obviously all the hazards we put onto an action tracker and then we do a cleaning procedure card. This is a cleaning procedure card is what we use. Obviously, if a lot of your uh, people on the call use Alchem, they help you and support you with these. So you can do a cleaning card for each piece of equipment and what you need to do to ensure that it's cleaned effectively and, and how to come, uh, clean that equipment. As I said, from the pure assessment, all the individual actual actions are then put onto an engineering action tracker, which they use internally, and they're ranked high, medium and low. So on your pure assessment, if you've got an I rating uh, piece of hazard on that equipment, obviously it's a red, they'll really put it and complete that within 24 hours. So it's really good at indicating to engineers what is iris, what's medium list, depending on what time they've got and what engineer resource they need to put onto that actual pure assessment and that piece of equipment. Involvement, I like to use the pure assessments in different types of ways. So it's used for pre-inspection. So before we even buy the machine, I like to go to actually the suppliers and look at it to see, you know, do the initial assessment so I can tell their supplier, these are what I'm identifying. This is really before you deliver it to us, what I need actually improving or uh, eliminating. It helps us actually develop policies. So the risk assessment tells us how we operate between management, we engineering, we operators, we asset cares. It identifies roles and responsibilities. So we all know where we fit within the machinery assessment, who's responsible for doing what, the engineers for making it safe, also making sure that electrical components on that machinery are safe. Engineering involvement is very important because obviously it's educating these guys and also people on, on site, you know, what to look for with machinery. So I involve the operators, the asset care people. It helps us track actions. We agree acceptable risk, because as I said, if you've got friction with a conveyor belt, you're not going to, to eliminate everyone. So you, you need to really accept some risk and really checking that completions have been completed. It's used for training and really the ownership then is really coming from us doing the actual pure assessment with it's been owned by engineers, it's been owned by operators moving forward to make sure that we're working with safe equipment. And you've got to look at competence. And over the time, I've, we've done a really training with TUV, done the actual accredited ones. I've done training with Finch, where they're in house training. They're all good providers, really, for training. But you've got to look at your own competence. And if you come to it, I can guarantee you, I ain't competent to go and look at this machine and assess it to say it's safe to use. So when you go. got to look at things you've got to put your own competence or your company experience also to help you when it comes to pure assessments so my vision really is wouldn't it be great for all industries to have one standard pure assessment that we could all use and we could all relate to one training package that we could use when it comes to sops and really one competence set my vision is really that in all industries we could do this and set the standard when it comes to pure assessments and use one document uh, one document I'm not saying use this document, but I think long term is we'd all know where we are. Obviously, the suppliers would know what we're requiring. It helps us with URS documentation that we all work into the same standards. And really, it's putting all the documents together in, into one format. Rewards are great, but obviously, when I was at McCain's, they gave me this because if they said that they're pure assessment to the NAMA, we'd never use one. I think it's very funny, but the biggest reward to me is keeping people safe. And the pure assessments are developing because this is just an example of a lot of machinery on, on the lines in our one of our bakery low risk. And it does help us develop lotto cards as well for areas. So we do number machinery and for every piece of machinery such as a conveyor on number one, we do a lotto card. And this is what as lotto cards look like. So you can see here, it gives the number of the asset where it is, what they identify the hazards with that machine to electricity, when do we use actually isolation? What do you need for individual isolation and also group isolation? And how would I isolate that piece of equipment? So by looking at the pure assessment, taking the right photos, you then be able to go back and develop your isolation cards for each piece of kit. 
and in every area we have these books for different numbers for different machines so every operator and asset guy who wants to work on that piece of equipment knows straight away how to isolate that piece of equipment we also use the pure assessments to do line safety checks as we know when you're working on, on operating equipment you want to really go and look at it and make sure that it's safe to use so every morning at six o'clock by the day we have a visual standard like a lot of people use uh, lean manufacturing so you can see these books visual in holders on that day the health and safety checks being completed and you know that it's ready for people to use within that for that 24 hour period so they will walk around that full line they'll tick the boxes whether it's a safety interlock whether it's an e-stop whether it's an isolator they know what to check as they're going around that machine and when they tick all those boxes they sign it color that front cover in actual green to say it's been completed it's safe if any of those safety devices aren't working on that line then obviously escalate it to get it sorted before that actual machine starts operating so your pure assessments do help you really when you're assessing that machinery you know where your isolators are know where your actual safety equipment is your interlock so you know how to develop then your line safety checks so Going on this, actually, uh, I know it's been quick going through it, but obviously time is a constraint. My conclusion is really, I hope I've given you an insight in how to undertake a pure assessment. The type of actual documentation which is available for people to follow the same process. It's not easy to do pure assessments when it comes to doing them. You know, once you've got all your uh, factory completed, it does come easy because it's only new equipment what you're purchasing or you're moving equipment about. So initially, if you've got no pure assessments, it is very time consuming. My advice is that you initiate at your earliest point of opportunity. You break your machinery down into assets and integrate it, your lines and make sure that you're really doing it so you get all your pure assessments completed. As a safety manager, I've never been asked really is any machine CE marked and being built to a set standard. But what I have been asked by inspectors is, can you show me your pure assessment? And by looking at pure assessments in the past and thinking, well, I'm not happy with this pure assessment. What can I do to make it better? I think now I'm at a stage where I'm comfortable, where I think that my risk assessments I use on site are suitable and sufficient. And if anybody comes there as a look at them, I can show the rationale where I've got that actual documentation from. I can see where I've related it to and where I've come to the conclusions and the, really the risk rate now for that actual equipment. So that's my advice to you is get on with your pure assessments, make sure you know what's suitable for yourself and make sure really you get more completed and don't make it a time consuming task for you to complete. Any questions? Well, um, <laughs> I think a lot of people would be gobsmacked by all the information you've got over in that, in that half an hour, David. Um, I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, it, it, I'll just set the scene. Um, there's a, a, be a few questions coming up over the next few minutes, I guess. So please put them in the chat and then we'll um, trample um, topics together. Um, just to make a few observations while people are collecting their thoughts. Um, you know, we call this a back to basic session. Um, David's example there is in a complex workplace, complex um, factory situation, production, um, with a whole range of machines. Now that may be a lot more complex than your own, than others' environments. <clears throat> um, I think the benefit of what you've just shown us, you've gone through the thinking process, which has got you to where you are. Um, an observation, um, IMEX, HSE inspector, and, and I know HSE have to take a pragmatic view um, about the minimum for compliance. And one of the issues about risk assessment, and of course the law says just record the significant findings in, um, in GB and likewise in, in Northern Ireland under our regulations for those if under any other legislation, uh, European wide and so on, then you may have other, uh, other parameters to consider. Um, and, and I think a lot of what you've given us as well demonstrates the value to the business about managing your assets, as you call them, the machinery, and ultimately, obviously, to protect your biggest asset, which is your people, which is where you started. Um, I, I would like to think that the examples you've given has given a, 
an excellent framework and some ideas to brothers to review their own approaches. I've always been a believer in the picture paints a thousand words and it's great to see um, that sort of impact that you have throughout your, if we call it the paperwork, but it may be digital. Um, so I think my first question, David, come into uh, your proposal ultimately for a standard approach. Um, some might argue one size doesn't fit all, but it's really about the framework for the content, I guess, you're coming from. Yeah. I would also like to ask, how how do you in practice test that, if you like, the right-hand column, the precautions, the practical things we need to do, actually get down to the people doing the job? How do you monitor that and, and get feedback? Thank you. Well, what, what I do when I start doing the pure assessments is, when we do the actual first uh, check on the machine's suppliers, we take the people operating that machine with us. So they help us actually integrate do that pure assessment. So we give them basic safe machinery safety knowledge. They go with us and we ask the questions, what do you think about this? What, why do you think this needs guarding here? And so we start developing as operators at the initial stage when we start purchasing the equipment. So we have a team. All the, all the guys operating it will go and have a look at the, the suppliers because the thing about it is, is from a safety point of view, I want it guarded and I want it protected. What that operator will tell you, yeah, but I need to walk on up on a regular basis, David. So I don't want fixed bolts, I want an interlock guard. And that's why it's important to get the operators involved. And so even they can learn me sometimes on equipment when you, when you go and look at it. Basic mistake there, switch uh, the yeah. microphone on. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to come to one of the more recent questions first, just to follow up that point, but just to reassure everybody, um, David's presentation um, and additional resources will be um, available on the uh, IOS Chilton site. Uh, and, and I guess they are already available on the Manchester group as well. Um, but the recording and the Q&A session will all be available for posterity. So you can come back to this, recommend it to your friends, uh, watch it at any time. Um, uh, uh, maybe, I, I, Ken, Jordan, are you, are you willing to um, un unmute yourself and um, ask your question? I think you, you, you raise a very important point about... Yes, I, <coughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, yes, I see that it did come up on the chat as uh, from me other from uh, anyone else. I'm, I'm not sure um, whether I'm reading that right. I guess my, my question to you, David, and, and thanks very much for the excellent presentation, was given all of the good stuff that you presented to us, what did you find didn't work so well, or what <laughs> do you feel you would do um, a little better in the future, if anything? I, I think the thing is, is one is a game to size, and it, it I mean, when you look when the pure regulations came in the machine regulations, why are we still looking at doing pure assessments now? And it was about people understanding what these regulations are about and, and how departments, how important it is that we all interact together from the operator point of view, from the cleaning guys, from engineers, because no disrespect to engineering, but, you know, we're good at giving them actions to complete all the time. They never understand why we're giving these actions. And I think that will be hardest for them to understand why and the reasons why we're saying this and, and where it actually originates from. And one of the things we did at our site is we get them all trained on, on pure assessments, on machinery. And it, it's like, I understand now what you're asking. OK, I'll fully support this. And I, I think that was the biggest thing is, is, one, I think the regulations when they came in, nobody really dealt with them. Now we're dealing with it and they understand them. They, they know what to do. So that was the biggest thing is, Giving all departments to have the same sort of ethos and understand why we're doing uh, pure assessments. Okay, so looking at your format, David, is there anything yeah. you intend to improve upon or modify going forward, or are you quite happy where you are today? It's always evolving because, I mean, it's 105 uh, pictorials now on hazards with machinery. Yeah. I think one of the things I'd like to do is the same format for basic equipment, such as pushing a rack and pushing a, a trolley, 
pure just talk about basic equipment doing assessment mm -hmm. is, is a basic simple form then for that basic equipment mm -hmm. to see you covered that within regulations as well okay thanks david thank you yeah thanks very much um and and if um you know i i, I will invite others to to ask the question i'm, I'm more than happy to present it um ju just looking back um uh, uh down the list um tina Tina Lowe's, you, you did ask about the risk matrix score. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi, I was just wondering, um, so a lot of risk assessments tend to have the risk matrix in it and tend to give a numerical score for certain hazards or for the risk in total. Um, I was just wondering for the Poovar assessments, do you find that useful? Does it actually mean anything to your employees or is it just a number? It, it's an indicator to us employees. They, they see an eye number, they know it's an eye risk. Uh, that's mainly what they use it for. It's more for the safety team and people in, in the department to look at to say, okay, how do we rank these and where we get the resource and the money to put these right? Okay. But they just see it as a number and a colour code. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think that was linked to um, Yeah, I think that was linked to my question at the beginning about how does it penetrate and how is it used in practice? Um, there's sort of a question related to this, um, just pulling up. Um, Adam, Adam Farm, would you like to ask your question? Um, you, you've asked if it's downloadable. Well, I've already confirmed it is. And I, I know, David, from the previous presentation at Manchester, um, you're more than willing to share and allow people to <laughs> plagiarise it, use whatever. And that's, that's yeah. um, a consummate safety professional willing to willing to share. I applaud you for that. Uh, and that's what these sessions are about. You know, pick up on good practice. Um, Adam, I, I can ask your question and just a follow up point, if you like. No, it, uh, the question, I mean, it was it was that it's about just learning and, and understanding more. The stuff I'm dealing with isn't anywhere near as complex, but you never know what is. And also, as someone who's certainly new to IOSH, I've been doing health and safety for a few years. I've spent a lot more time in your standard general workplace risk assessment type of thing. Um, we know it's significant risks, but then it's also where, where do you draw the line? If you've got a piece of equipment that someone's used every single day, you don't want to go into overdrive on it because you then turn people off. So it's just, for me, it's knowing that, um, that point as to how far you go to, to see this where you've clearly got to go a lot further it's it's really interesting um but i don't think i need it just yet unless unless someone proves me wrong and uh you know my desk and chair and other things need this level of uh, assessment yeah, thank you adam I mean, that's exactly the purpose for recording this so um you know you've got that that discussion for david's thinking process and you know it, inevitably during your career if you're starting out um even as late as me in the waning years of mine you end up working in new environments, seeing new machinery. So it's given you that, that way to capture and the idea of 105 uh, individual hazards, who would have thought there are that many things you, you're looking at or may need to. Um, Alan Johnson made a comment more than anything um, about this format actually encourages communication between departments. I think, you know, David, that's, that's exactly the value for your company, isn't it? Getting engineering involved. Uh, frontline managers, supervisors, up to senior management, I guess. How do you report back um, on the findings from me? We, we have a, 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 an improvement plan. So we have a safety improvement plan. In that improvement plan, we have certain categories. So is it machinery, is it manual handling, etc. And every year we put in there our improvements, what we require by machinery. So we get audited on this, so obviously we have a new piece of kit comes in. Have you done the pure assessment? Is it on your improvement plan? Yes, it is. When you have a plan to complete it, so our, our, our his improvement plan is really good. What we have for health and safety, and every site has that improvement plan, and that's how we monitor and manage really to make sure we get those improvements completed. And the site GM then is accounted for that to say, as he moving forward, as he improved that site sufficiently for the business. That's what we do. And being linked into maintenance, etc., as well. What about training? How do you pick up um, uh, if you identify a pattern emerging, develop a toolbox talk based on elements of, of the yeah. line risk assessment? I mean, obviously, we, we do the training on the line startup shakes, which are training in isolation. 
we do the training on machinery inspection, the operator training. So this is all linked. So we have his near miss systems in place, behavioral observations. And obviously we have trainers what go around and observe people to make sure they're still adhering to them practices. So they will make sure that people are working to that SOP, what's been related to that machinery. So all these different tools are identified to see whether we need to modify, change, and look at things in a different way. Yeah, um, Alan's just asked a question here. Would, would you like to put it to David, Alan? If you unmute yourself. Sorry about that. I was trying to work out how to unmute myself. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, just no excellent presentation. I think everyone has said that. It's very informative. Um, I just said there, one of the things that as a, as a, as a team that we often get asked by audits, uh, auditors is how we monitor the effectiveness of a corrective action. Um, we've created a whole new column in our... Um, oh. We lost you there, Alan. Was there something at the end of your question? You've created a new column, I think you said. Maybe his signal was poor. David, perhaps you could uh, just... Sorry, am I, am I, am I oh, back? He's back. He's back. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, one of the things is, is the monitoring of effectiveness of a corrective action. It's um, one of the things that we did was introduce a new column in our action track. But I was wondering if this pure um, format that, that you've got there, David, if, if that tracks, and I think it does from what you were saying about you follow it up with um, additional uh, yeah. viewing to make sure that everyone's doing what they said they should be doing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you know yourself when you do an action, there's two ways. You can have a reactive action to say, okay, there's been another accident by that similar sort of causation. What's happened with that machine? Yeah, so now. I'm... Or you're looking at the, the, you know, the measure. And, you know, they're the sort of things what we use as a general safety tool, so, you know, making sure it's effective. You know, the biggest way it's more effective is you have to use anybody in that same way, in that same causation. So if you've yeah. identified the risk, you've completed it, you know, it, it should be there forever. Yeah, yeah, no, brilliant. No, thanks for that. Well, thank you for, for um, asking that one as well. Um, I, you know, in a way, I, I, I think that, that, that follows, um, you know, the HSE plan, do, check and act. <laughs> We've gone round the full circle. Um, and hopefully that's given some people uh, some of you there, some alternative approaches, because I think it's always good to look at what you've, what you've done um, as an inspector, as a consultant. I see far too many risk assessments. It's about getting the paperwork done. It's stuck in a folder somewhere. It's not a living document. Uh, it's got to be linked to the systems of work or method statements as well. Uh, and I've seen some which you know, incorporate those in the one document. I just wondered if that's an area you've, you, you've looked at, David. Yeah, I mean, the segment at, at front, you know, really integrates into that when we do write the SOP. And if we do make any changes to that machinery in that pure assessment, we will go back and review all those documents as, uh, as it integrated this into that training specification. Does it identify the hazard on that SOP? And also the safety interlocks, et cetera, all the way around. We, we do follow that full circle again. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious, we, we, we said it was going to be a prequel of an hour session. It could go on for a, a power hour, I think, at, at this rate. Um, I, I, I'll make two, I can't see any other questions in there. Um, so just um, two, two issues I would like really picking up right at the start. I thought um, when you were talking about needing knee pads, I thought that was for praying, actually. Um, <laughs> no. But... <laughs> Uh, I think you've got it all under control, so hopefully you won't have to uh, rely on, on external support like that. Um, and, and I think the, the, the other thing you mentioned, it was good that you, you talked about um, uh, picking up the other hazards, like the manual handling related thing. What a great link to next week's session. Please, all of you, join us again at one o'clock next Wednesday for a, a similar excellent session. Uh, on manual handling by one of our committee members who um, is prepared to show what they've done in a, a very large printing company. They, um, like, like David's, you know, a large sort of food manufacturers um, packaging side. Um, uh, our speaker next week, Lee Owens, is from 
uh, one of the largest printers in the country, uh, printing newspapers, etc., etc. So you can imagine uh, their manual handling problems and uh, how they run through a toolbox talk and, and uh, training, as well as um, a, a visual tour as well of the premises. I, I can't see any other questions here, and my chair, Melissa, is, is reminding me of the timing. And we said we would stick for three quarters of an hour. Um, some of us will certainly stay on uh, for a few minutes afterwards uh, from the committee. And uh, I think we've got Bernard as well from Staff Branch. So um, uh, we're going to be running a session um, on Lola um, with jointly with them um, a bit later on in the month. So um, perhaps if you've got a few more minutes, Bernard, you stay on afterwards. Otherwise, um, I'm about to bring the hammer down and say, Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Please make use of it. Visit our website. Follow us on Twitter. We're trying to get it. We've got over a thousand followers on LinkedIn, and we're trying to get as many on Twitter. We're getting closer. We're in our 800s now. So please do follow us. That's where we tend to keep things up to date. Um, it's been an excellent session. I think on behalf of everybody, I think that's worth a round of applause, even if uh, those of you visually, anyway. So thank you very much. And, uh, we look forward to seeing some of you who are in the Chiltern area face to face sometime in the future. If not, we'll be seeing you virtually. Um, I think we're going to carry on with these um, mixed media um, meetings in the future anyway. So great to have had so many of you with us today. Thank you very much.